um, encourage you to, to, to think about this concept in terms of changing your own behaviour. I'll then talk a little bit about the concept um, of assertiveness and some of the research. Um, and then I'm going to hopefully, if it works, um, share with you um, some insights um, from our website. Um, and also then we'll go to uh, Lynette and get some tips from her as to how she is assertive in her own um, work life. So do feel free if you have questions and uh, we have somebody behind the scenes on Slido um, who will put a, a poll there about what stops you from saying no. Um, and encourage you if you feel comfortable to share your small goal from today on our members only Facebook group. Um, I think you've all got your microphones muted and your cameras off. Uh, if you have any problems, uh, contact the support team. And I do always encourage you to just try to, you know, not multitask um, and do your emails at the same time, but just to focus on, on this talk and you in the process. So just to remind you, we um, have talked in the past three webinars a little bit about why it can be helpful in our super busy lives if we want to change aspects of ourselves to focus on small wins or sometimes referred to as tiny habits. And you can go back to those webinars if you've missed them to remind yourself of some of those concepts. Um, what I wanted to do really was just share a small goal that I set many years ago around this topic of assertiveness. And, and so in a sense, this is an example how, of how if you've got a goal and, and it might be a goal like be more assertive, um, that is a very vague goal. And if you want to have a chance of actually addressing it, it's important to try to set these much more specific and smaller, more achievable goals so you know, you know if you're making progress or not. And I put there a photo some of you might be familiar with. This is a photo of Trump and his team. And um, it's, it actually uh, is a cue because many years ago when I was a senior lecturer, I worked at a department um, that sort of looked a little like this in terms of demographic composition, let's say. And uh, we used to have these departmental meetings and they were very intimidating for me as a senior lecturer um, to be surrounded by these senior, mostly male professors who'd often been in the organisation for many, many years. Um, and yet I felt it was really important to, to have a presence at these meetings and to speak uh, because we discussed things that were really shaping the future of the department and of course therefore my future. Um, but I found it very intimidating. So I set myself the goal of saying one thing at every meeting um, and that might not sound like much but at the time that, that, was, that was a challenge for me. So one thing at every meeting. And I could allow myself to, I could ask a question. It could be, um, I don't understand that um, history. Could you explain it to me? Or it could be agreeing with someone else. Um, you know, I really support and endorse what such and such said. It's been my experience as well. Um, or it could be a suggestion or an idea. And the, I did it like that because it's much easier actually to say, hey, I agree with someone. It's much easier to ask a question than it is to sort of put forward a view. Um, and and um, the goal is really just to get me speaking, just to have voice um, instead of just sitting there. And, uh, and so that was my goal and, and I did achieve that. And eventually you get to the point where you don't have to think, you just speak when you've got something to say. Um, but sometimes when you're not being assertive, you do have to have these more planned approaches. So I just wanted to share that as a kickoff of how if you are wanting to be more assertive, it might be helpful to try and create a more specific and a smaller goal. What I want to do now is I want to talk about what assertiveness is and why it matters. And many of you will know this already, so I won't spend too long on this. I want to really get more to the tips. But often if we think about it, assertiveness is really, it's about asserting things for you, for your wants and needs, 
without overriding the needs of others. So you can see that little figure there. If you are um, ignoring your own needs and your own wants um, and allowing, put, not putting them forward through a lack of assertiveness and letting other people's needs dominate, that's sort of what we often refer to as being quite passive. But if you, on the other hand, are just, you know, um, very strongly um, putting forward your needs in a very dominant way and not really caring about other people's needs, then that's really that notion of being aggressive. So assertiveness is about caring and putting forward your needs, your wants, your voice, your goals, but in a way that doesn't usurp others. And we'll often hear, you know, this idea of, on the one hand, being passive and not putting forward your own needs, on the other hand, being aggressive and dominating other people's needs. We also see sometimes people being sort of passive aggressive, which is when you're perhaps a bit manipulative um, or um, emotionally dishonest, as, as that example says there. And we also sometimes see um, the passive aggressive flip, which is where you're passive for a long time and then you just get so fed up that you just flip into aggression. So what we really want to focus on is being assertive. Um, and here's some examples, saying no, refusing unreasonable requests, asking someone else to behave differently, communicating clearly how an event or situation has made you feel, expressing an opinion, pursuing your goals. They're all examples of, aggress of assertive behaviour. And I'm not going to go into detail, but because you know this yourselves from your, your own lives, but there's a lot of research on the benefits of assertiveness, not, not just in terms of getting what you want. Sometimes it's really more about your mental health because being assertive doesn't guarantee that you get what you want, but usually if you're assertive and you're clear, you're going to feel better about yourself. Um, and so it's good for your mental health and well-being. Um, as well as, you know, of course, um, meeting your own needs. Guys, you can get a sense from that of what these videos are like. And what that video showed, um, which we didn't get a chance to see, it was really about some of the laureates talking about, you know, how they decide what to say yes and no to. And, um, and you know, that's, that's part of being assertive, right? You can't assert yourself, you can't say no, unless you know what you should actually say no and what you want to say no to. And when you watch that video, and I encourage you to do that after the presentation today, what you'll see is that they're very thoughtful and strategic about what they say no to. They've really thought about it. So you can see the first um, laureate fellow there was talking about um, she only says uh, yes to certain sorts of reviewing activities where she feels she can help someone or, or whatever. And so I think a very important first step, and I think Lynette's going to pick up on this a little bit later, is, you know, knowing, having some thought, some reflection um, around what it is you should say yes and no to. Really happy to take some more questions about that um, as we go through. So that's the first step, is knowing what you want and knowing what your needs are. And then, of course, once you figure that out, you've got to then think about how to assert yourself. And if you were, um, if you if you've come, if you're as old as me, you you would have been around when there used to be this thing called assertiveness training, which strangely seems not to be very popular anymore. But the classic sorts of tips that you would get from assertiveness training would be first of all just being very clear and direct in your communication. And there's some examples there. You know, I think what you've done is good, but I would like to see more of. So often when we talk, we have, you know, well, possibly, maybe, sorry, oh, I'm not sure if I should say this. We have all these qualifiers and things that make our communication very indirect. And that then sounds like we don't really know what we want to say. Um, and that can um, detract from you expressing what really matters to you. So being clear and direct and talking about what you think and what you want, so using I, is, is important. Another classic would be to, if, if there's something that is, um, you know, upsetting you or causing you problems, again, this is difficult to talk to people about, 
Um, but one very powerful technique is to just describe how another person's behaviour um, affects the way you feel. So, for example, when you raise your voice, it makes me scared. I would like you to speak softly. Um, so when you do this, this is what happens and then what I would like you to change. So when you don't tell me what you are feeling, I feel confused. I would like you to explain to me what you are feeling. Um, and that's a very, that sounds so simple, but it's remarkably hard to do, but a really powerful habit. And I would quite, I would slightly tweak the way they say that. I would say, when you raise your voice, I feel scared rather than when you raise your voice, it makes me scared because that's to me a little bit passive still. When you feel what when you raise your voice, I feel scared. I would like to speak more softly. And then another classic tip is this broken record technique. And one of the things that happens with assertiveness is we, we say what we want nicely and clearly, and then someone comes back with some argument or some uh, explanation and we back down straight away. And the broken technique, record technique, it's just about, you know, well, we don't even have records anymore, but <laughs> um, that is just about, you know, repeating what you would want. Yeah, I would like a refund. And then blah de blah de blah. Yes, but I would still like a refund. I've heard what you said, but I still want a refund. Now, so those are the classic tips that you'll often get, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with them, um, about how to be assertive. But what I really want to focus my comments on uh, next is the, um, except I can't seem to go forward. Oh, yes, I can. The I really want to focus on this concept of the, oops, I've lost my slides. <laughs> sorry, Sana, would you mind coming back in? Um, sorry about that, everyone. Um, I'll just keep talking because I can do that all day. Um, so, um, what happens is when we are assertive, we sometimes get some sort of penalty as a consequence. And that's really what I want to focus on today. And so um, we're talking really here now about gender role theory. And there's a whole theory around the fact that um, women and men, um, there are stereotypes associated with our behaviour. And these stereotypes really influence um, uh, um, what is expected of us as men and women. So as this gender stereotype for women, uh, it wouldn't be a surprise to you, I suspect. And it really stems from our traditional role in society um, of sort of carer and raiser of children, um, is that women are meant to be um, caring, nurturing, and um, uh, very humble, and that's the way that women are meant to be. And um, men, on the other hand, are meant to be assertive and um, this one here, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sana. Uh, meant to be assertive and, and so on and so forth, and, and, and leaders and aggressive. Um, but um, sorry guys, just can't try and do two things here at once. Um, not sure what happened there. I think it could be the video causing us problems. <laughs> Video's working now, we don't want it to. That's it there. So thank you, Sana. Um, so one of the consequences of this uh, situation, these beliefs that we hold, is that it's very hard for women to be warm and competent. So we have this sort of expectation that women will be warm and that's gender, con that's congruent with the stereotypes. Um, but it's very hard then for women to be both warm and competent because competence and leadership, that's much more associated with male stereotypes. So one of the things that tends to happen, and there's a lot of research on this, is that women tend to be seen as either warm and incompetent. So you might people might say, sort of, oh, she's wonderful and caring and nurturing, but she's sort of weak, or cold and competent. And I mean, we, there are many examples, we could go on and on and on about the way female politicians, as an example, are treated. And Clint, uh, Hillary Clinton is one example. She's a competent woman, 
but then she is often assumed to be shrill or aggressive or and there's there's language like the Clinton cackle. So it's and then we see Jacinta Ardern from the uh, from New Zealand, and um, oftentimes when she's doing compassionate things, that's very congruent with the gender stereotypes. So that's great; everyone loves her. But when she raises her voice or is more assertive, then you see similar sort of negative comments about her. So um, what this means is that women end up sort of walking on this tightrope. And on the one hand, to um, be sort of consistent with stereotypes, you know, women have to be warm, likeable, sensitive, caring. But of course, if they do that, then that can result in a sort of form of benevolent sexism. Also, it can be very hard for women to be seen as competent, as I've said. On the other hand, if women are assertive, agentic, leaders, negotiators, competitive, all the things that are associated with um, male stereotypes, we often see this backlash. Um, and we often see, and this is why women are much more often described as aggressive and demanding, and you all know that sort of language. So I just want to be clear, there's a lot of evidence um, underpinning these ideas. So this is not just made up to sound good. Um, so here's one example of many. When women act in stereotype consistent ways, one of the consequences can be that they are undervalued because it's expected. So in other words, when women do all the helping, altruistic behaviours, citizenship, we would call it in universities, um, in the workplace, weirdly, we don't sort of get credit for that. And the reason we don't get credit for it is because it's sort of what women do. It's what's expected of them. So one of my favourite studies um, is that Hyman and Chen study here. And just to very quickly highlight it, um, the study involved you create some CVs of men and women and you describe um, their, what, let's say it's a woman, let's say it's Sally, and you describe Sally's performance and you describe how she's helpful and does all these things and you describe also, you know, her performance in other aspects of her work. And um, you get people to rate, you know, what performance appraisal rating would you give this person? Would you give this person a raise? Would you promote this person? All that sort of thing. And then you do give people the exact same um, fictional person, but it's not Sally anymore. You change the name and you make it Simon. And what that sort of research shows, and it's a bit more sophisticated than that, but in a nutshell, is that if women um, are assumed to do all this helping and good team player and extra volunteering work and so on and so forth, actually they get no brownie points um, in terms of ratings of performance. If men, if people think it's men that's doing it, they get brownie points. They're seen as, you know, extra great for doing this behaviour. Um, if women um, have a um, CV that looks like that and they don't perform those behaviours, and so that would be very counter stereotypical, um, then they are very severely punished. So they get much lower performance ratings um, than they normally would. If men don't perform those behaviours, it makes no difference to their ratings. So in other words, you know, and I know that many women experience this, um, women academics that were asked to do a lot of things, um, you know, those sort of helpful things, being on committees and so on, but it's not necessarily rewarded um, in those evaluations of our performance. So that's just one piece of research. Um, on the other side of the coin, there's a lot of research that if women are assertive and agentic and, and so on, that's got some negative um, consequences. So for example, uh, one piece of research, women who assert themselves intellectually um, in group discussions, like speaking up with ideas and so on, that results in negative effect um, from others in the group. Another example, compared with men, women who initiate salary negotiations or behave in assertive, self-promoting manner in a job interview, 
are seen as overly demanding, less socially skilled and less likeable. And here's this point about it's very hard to be competent and warm and likeable at the same time. Uh, men receive a boost in their perceived status after expressing anger, but women who express anger are seen as lower status and less competent. Now, of course, I'm not saying this happens in every situation for all women and all men. I'm reporting to you average sorts of findings from the research. But you can see from this uh, research why it is not enough just to say to women, well, be more assertive because women have different experiences um, often when they are more assertive. And so as a consequence, women are often not so assertive. And it's not because we're weak, it's because it can be very challenging to do that. And there's a very lovely study, for example, by Breskel, um, which actually looked at US senators and measured the power of people and then the amount they speak and found that the more that men are powerful, the more they speak, um, you know, so if you're higher, you know, got more power, bigger constituency base or whatever, you speak more. But there was not any relationship between power and speaking out for women. And that's because even if you're a powerful woman, you've learned that it may not be perceived um, so positively if, you dom if you're quite dominant in your speech. Um, and they replicated that in some other samples as well. So what do we do about all this? Well, ideally, first of all, we wouldn't have to, right, do anything because ideally things would be different and men and women would be judged by the same standards. Um, of course, that's maybe not always the case. And so we do, in the meantime, need some strategies. And the most important strategy that the research suggests is what you've got to try to do is convey warmth and competence. In other words, um, if you want to avoid some of those backlash things that I've talked about, it's about trying to be assertive and friendly at the same time. Um, so if we look at, um, first of all, the situation um, where you maybe, you know, you're called aggressive or you're concerned that people are thinking you're too aggressive or whatever, here's some tips. So, for example, you might bookend your assertions with friendly greetings. So if it were if it were an email, for example, you can be very friendly and feminine. Uh, I'll put that in quotation marks. You know, um, at the beginning of the email, um, then you're very assertive, and then you're very friendly at the end of the email. And you can do that in your interactions with people as well. Um, negotiations. When you're negotiating, try to frame them more as asking. Uh, another um, suggestion that comes out of the research is that um, if you're physically dominant and strong and you're also friendly and communal, in other words, you're competent in your body language, but you're warm in your messaging, some research shows that that actually um, doesn't tend to have such a backlash as that more dominant speech and things that you might have. So that's about having very clear eye contact, standing tall, taking up space and so on. Um, but combining that with that friendliness. Um, another strategy is about being deliberate when you are more masculine and obviously always putting these in quotation marks because I'm really talking about stereotypes here. Um, so being deliberate about when you're more masculine versus feminine. And so a CEO, for example, said, you know, I'm a, more, I'm a warm mother 95% of the time so that when I need to be tough, I can be. Um, and because anger is seen very negatively in women, um, using anger sparingly. And there is some research that shows that if you're angry all the time, it sort of not, doesn't have so much um, positive impact, but just occasionally anger can be um, helpful. So those are some tips if you're, if you're often getting um, persuaded, getting sort of um, accused of or judged to be sort of too aggressive or, or dominant and competitive and so on. But oh, here's some research just on that. So there's a meta-analysis, for example, and anyone who's interested, I've put the references there, you can look it up. 
that um, this research showed that if you're dominant, that hurts your likability if you're a woman, um, not so much for men, and also things like your higher ability. But dominance expressed explicitly is negative. So that affects women's likability, whereas more implicit forms of dominance, like eye contact, wasn't didn't incur this sort of backlash. So you think about, you know, being strong physically, um, but combining that with those communal messages. And if we go to the other side of the coin and you're someone who really struggles to be assertive, here's some tips um, for you. So um, first of all, is, as I've already said, try that very clear, direct language um, and be succinct. One of the areas you see people slip into not being as they, they, they make a beautiful, strong, assertive statement and then they keep going and, and then it becomes waffly and apologetic. So, you know, say what you want to say and just stop then, <laughs> don't keep going. Um, one thing I think works well, and so this is a, a tip, um, that I do quite a lot actually. And this is again, this combination of being assertive, so say no, but also communal, offer other help instead. So for example, a classic would be, you know, if you're asked to be, um, do a review. Now this is all automated now and, and you're forced to do this, but I always would say, look, I'm sorry, I can't um, do the review right now. However, I'd suggest such and such as a possible reviewer. Or if you're asked to be on um, a committee or if you're asked to read a proposal or all those things that sometimes you just have to say no to because you cannot possibly do. If there's a way that you can say, look, no, I can't sit on that committee, but I can offer this instead. And of course, you're making sure it's something that is manageable for you and that's going to take you, you know, one minute instead of five hours on a committee. I find that that is a, a strategy that um, works. And I mean, as what you can see is it's sort of what I said before, it's this combination of being assertive, but also communal um, as well. Um, another thing is, again, I've mentioned that sometimes a lot of the, the, the sort of so-called women's work is then not valued. Um, um, you know, you want to say no to that. One way to do it again is to highlight your competence in doing that. So I'd love to help, but I'm working on a major grant application right now. Joe would be perfect for this. So you're saying, what you're saying with that is you're saying, I'd like to help, but I'm doing this really important other big thing. Um, and, and there you're highlighting your competence. So you're again, sort of being both warm and competent simultaneously. So that's a really important strategy. And this woman called Joan Williams has written a book on this. She calls it gender judo. And it's a practice where you train yourself to behave in a warm, nurturing way with just a sprinkling of mother superior. Um, and um, there's an article there if anyone wants to, to look that up. And here she gives another example uh, with that little picture there. Um, you know, when someone is talking but um, doesn't stop, you know, you actually could start talking over him, which is quite assertive, um, possibly a little aggressive. Um, and then, you know, say, I'm sorry, I thought you were finished. So you've done something seen as masculine interrupting, but in a feminine way. So, um, and I just, again, want to point out, I won't read that, but there's research that backs up that if women are able to be a bit flexible in how they do this sort of thing. So combining this warmth and competence, then they are, it does help with some outcomes. Second set of tips, and I'm nearly, nearly done here, is, um, is to frame your assertive message. So research shows that two frames help. One is just being very clear about um, what you're doing. So I'm going to express my opinion very directly. I'll be as specific as possible. And the research shows that if you do this, it shows that you're, you're not sort of some, um, you know, emotional woman who can't control herself. So you're going to put forward this quite assertive view, but you're sort of warning the person. 
Um, and the evidence shows that that actually makes your um, assertion um, um, less likely to get that backlash we've been talking about. And another one, and I think this also um, is a really nice one, is sometimes when you're being assertive and saying no or dealing with something difficult, it's important to talk about why that why, so that the value that's underpinning what you do. So, you know, I see this as a matter of honesty and integrity, so it's important for me to be clear about where I stand. So if you're in a difficult meeting, um, and you want to say something and it's really hard, you know, you could say um, it's really important for me to speak out right now because I really value this team and I want to help us move forward. And then and then you go into what you want to say. Um, so um, and then a third tip there is it can help also to sort of share your good intent. So again, it sort of just warns people a little bit that this assertiveness is coming. Um, I came to speak with you to find the best way to solve our problem. I didn't come here to point a finger or blame. And again, some evidence that that can help sort of um, mitigate this backlash that's sometimes there. So I'm just going to summarise some of those feelings and uh, some of those thoughts, and then we will go um, to introduce Lyn Lynette to you. Um, the first thing is that assertiveness is about clearly expressing your needs and wants without overriding or ignoring those of others. And that's really what we're talking about here. So saying no when you know you want to say no, um, speaking out when you've got an idea, these sorts of things. First, we need to understand what it is you want to assert. So you can't say yes or no. Um, unless you know whether you want to say yes or no. And by the way, in that video that I skipped over, uh, one of the women makes a great suggestion at the end of it. She said that what she does is that she says something like, somebody asks her in the moment, you know, can you please be on this committee or whatever? She'll say something like, because she finds it hard, to just she might be immediately thinking like, uh, no, but it's hard to say no in the minute. And sometimes you don't know, right? You want to think about it. So she'll say something like, um, that sounds like a really important um, position. And I would like to really think about whether I'm able to do that, you know, to the, the standard um, that would be required. Let me get back to you. And then you're also able to, at a later time when you've thought about it, put it in an email and it might be easier to do it that way. So um, if you don't know what to assert in the moment, have a little strategy, a little routine for um, moving that decision when you can think about it. Because I think sometimes you get taken by surprise and you agree to do things um, and then you, you regret them forever. So um, that watch that video if you want to get a little bit on that tip. When you know what you want to do, what you want to say no to, what you want to say yes to, then we've got to think about how to be assertive. And all the guidance in the assertiveness literature is about being clear and direct. Um, but there is an assertiveness penalty because women are meant to be warm and friendly and caring, and they're not really meant to be assertive and strong leaders. Um, and I say that all in inverted commas. So um, that consequence of that, it's very hard for women to be simultaneously competent and warm. They're either incompetent and, co and um, warm, so that wonderful but weak, or they are competent but cold. And you can think of that sort of Hillary Clinton slide there. Um, and, you know, as I said, ideally this would not be true and ideally we'd all be judged in the same way. Um, sometimes if you're in an environment where you think some of that might be going on, then this gender judo can be a strategy. So being conveying warmth and competence simultaneously. And I've also suggested some ways that you can frame your messages. Um, we had a lot of questions actually with this webinar. We had hundreds of questions and um, many of them were really about well, how do I be assertive if it's with my supervisor or someone in power? Um, and how do I do assertive without being seen to be, you know, um, you know, um, too aggressive? And all of this sort of content that I've just shared really, really speaks to, to um, those sorts of questions. So I hope that is helpful. And I'm now absolutely delighted to hand you over to a, a ARC Laureate Fellow, Professor Lynette 
Russell from Monash University and you can see there and you can find out more about um, Lynette later with that website. She is the director of the Monash Indigenous Studies Centre, uh, incredibly esteemed researcher and also a very generous woman who we're very glad did not say no uh, today. Um, and so I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that you can see Lynette and hear from her uh, about her experiences in this area. So are you there, Lynette? I am here. Can you see me? Um, I yes. cannot. Yes, you're coming. Yes, perfect. Coming. Okay. You're there. You are there. Okay. <laughs> launch. You can launch. I can launch. All right. Yep. Well, <laughs> First of all, thank you, Sharon, for the invitation to, to have this conversation. It's very important to me. Um, I'm just going to take it, just a, a moment of indulgence because really what I'm going to be doing is talking about values because for me, the way to determine what I want to say no to and where I want to speak up is based on my values. So for that reason, I'm just going to quickly make an acknowledgement of country and the traditional owners. Uh, Melbourne is a modern city, as you might know. But beneath the kilometres of coaxial cable and broadband, tonnes of concrete, mountains of steel, every footfall I take is Aboriginal land. There were once dreaming tracks, now there are tram tracks and bike lanes, walking paths and roads. But for 3,000 generations, mother to son, father to daughter, we lived here, we thrived and we survived. Watched the sea level rise to create Port Phillip Bay, saw the Birrarung Yarra River flood and then retreat. This is a connection that's never been broken. It's been tested at times, but never broken. And it's to those ancestors that I acknowledge, but also I respect and am guided by. It's to those that I try and listen. And those are the values at the core of everything I do. So when I'm saying what I think, what I'm going to say yes to and what I'm going to speak up on, this is these are opinions, very much opinions that formed from my experience. My experience is such that I've worked for at least 25, close to 30 years in the university sector. But prior to that, I um, ran a, a cultural heritage business with my husband. And I, even before that, I worked in the public service. I think the key thing in all of this is knowing yourself. You need to understand who you are. I'm a people pleaser. That's not a very helpful thing to be when you need to say no quite often. So I've had to really work at knowing who I am, what my values are, and make sure that everything I do is values driven. I was also the only female voice for a very long time in the um, arts faculty executive. I'm very pleased to say now it's in fact almost entirely the reverse. But I can remember the very first time I needed to speak up and I was so anxious and so nervous that my voice began to crack and break and I have this dis very distinct clear memory that I never wanted to experience that again. So building confidence is the key thing for me. If I have to go into a meeting that I'm anxious about, I do what I call my Wonder Woman. I stand in the bathroom with my hands on my hips and I take lots of really deep breaths to the point where I even start to feel a little lightheaded because really what it's doing is centering me and making me remember what are my core values, why am I here. I also have other little tricks I might share with you. I have three little silver rings on this hand which I had engraved with the word detach because sometimes I feel so attached to an idea, so attached to the institution, so attached to what's going on that I'm not being very sensible just to remind myself, sometimes I need to detach. And it's important to differentiate between you as a person with values and your work. Because sometimes what you think is a criticism of you is a critique of your work. The key thing in deciding what you want to say no to and when to speak up is setting your priorities. Set them regularly and revisit them often. These are internal and external. I think academia is a, a funny thing because in lots of ways the whole idea of work-life balance and all the rest is a kind of weird experience for us because we do live for what we do often. 
Um, I also live with another academic. So it's a very, you know, it's a household where we often are having these sorts of conversations about the, the latest email that came in over breakfast. Uh, but it's important, really, really important to set those priorities. If you want to be promoted, for example, you need to know what is required of you to be promoted. That's an obvious example, but there's lots and lots of other things. If you want a book contract, you need to understand how to go about getting a book contract. We are actually trained out of self-knowledge self in the academy, and we're particularly trained out of it doing our PhDs. We become dependent on the authorial voice and the authoritarian voice of others. That's why we cite them. That's why we refer to them. And we have to remind ourselves that we are experts one in our field, but also we are the experts on ourselves. Don't rush. This is the key, one of my absolutely key messages. Don't rush when someone asks you something. Don't say no immediately and don't say yes immediately. There's a very neat little trick on Gmail if you use Gmail and it's, it's the schedule function. If somebody wants you to do something and you don't want to do it and you've decided, no, I'm not going to do that, you could write no straight away. But rather than sending that email 30 seconds after you've received it, schedule it. Schedule it to go off in a day or so. At the very least, it'll look like you thought. <laughs> time management is crucial. The more you can manage your time and control your time, the more time you have to say yes. And we are not really taught time management. There are lots of opportunities at universities to take part in training exercises. There's often things on offer, you know, that, and time management is one of them. They're not always immediately effective, I think, for academics, but make, take, make the most of them. There are other resources that I use a lot too. Certainly the professor is in, which is a, a website, an American website, which I really highly recommend. And the occasional TED talk can be incredibly useful too when you need a bit of a boost. When you get a decision that you need to make and you're not really sure whether you want to do it, you don't want to do it, do you have time to do it, don't you have time to do it, is it, is it a thinly veiled request for a whole lot more work than you anticipate, take your time, list up the pros and cons. It's much better for you if you can actually think through very clearly the advantages of doing this, I, I will get my profile raised, or the advantages of doing this is people in that particular institution who know me and that's in my hometown and one day I want to go back and work in my hometown. Well, just stop. I'm just listening to our assertiveness training in academia, research. Oh. <laughs> How do they know it? Somebody hasn't got their microphone off. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's okay. okay Continue I'll, on, Lynette. I'll keep going. Find a critical friend or a network or a cohort. For a long time, a, a good colleague and I always agreed that whenever we got an invitation that we weren't sure what to do with, we'd run it by each other. Just talk it through, you know. I really want to do that because it's in Finland and I've never been to Finland and they're, you know, they're offering to fly me there and it sounds absolutely wonderful. Yes, but it's also in Finland and that's a long way and it's going to, and always assume that whatever you're going to do takes three times as long as you say it's going to take. So I want to go to Finland, I'll be there for a week. I can guarantee you it'll get, take me two weeks to recover from being in Finland for just the one week and it'll take me at least a week to prepare. Everything takes longer than you think it's going to take. There's some very good coaching available if you are at a university. We've had some excellent coaching and I've had some leadership coaching, which I found really, really useful. But there's other opportunities too, things like mentoring. You can sign up to be mentored, but also consider being a mentor. It doesn't matter what stage of your career you're at. You can have lateral mentors, you can have uh, mentors above you, but mentoring is actually two way and it gives you someone else that you can talk to about how do I say no and when should I say yes. I'm actually deeply introverted 
it's, it's my nature is to be an introverted person. So I have to work very, very hard to do things like today or any of those kinds of activities where you, you have to stand up and you have to project. I often have to go back into my office and shut the door and lie on the floor on my yoga mat because <laughs> I just need to breathe a little bit. But think about it. Sometimes we, we become overwhelmed in these circumstances because we've got more than one emotion going at once. And certainly for anyone who's living through Melbourne through this pandemic, I can promise you there's been lots of moments where we've been overwhelmed. But identify your triggers. What was it that overwhelmed me? Was it that I, when I looked at my email, there were 60 emails there? Um, learn the difference between urgent and important. I venture to say 90% of the emails that we get are described as urgent, but they're not important. You do need to know the difference. Lynette, sorry, I'm just in the interest of time. Yes. If you could just wrap up and then yep. Georgia will give us some questions, which will give you another chance to sure. share your wisdom. Sure. Okay, my, my key is I never wanted to be the sort of leader that would pull the ladder up behind them, climb up the ladder and then snatch it up behind them. I... My values, my number one value outside of what I just talked about before is generosity and kindness. Those two things drive everything I do. So lots of things I say no to, lots of things I say yes to. But um, yeah, very happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Lynette. So Georgia, over to you. And um, just to introduce Georgia, she is a, a Forest um, Foundation Fellow, I've forgotten exactly what it is, but a postdoc in our research centre and has very kindly agreed to pass on some questions uh, to Lynette and, and myself. So over to you, Georgia. Sure. I think, um, as you said, we're conscious of time, so I'll keep, um, I think there are kind of two main questions or and comments and ideas that perhaps the first that's more relevant to you, Lynette, and perhaps the second that's more relevant to you, Sharon, but obviously yep. pop in when you want to. Um, Lynette, I love, and I think everyone else has loved all your little um, tips and tricks around um, saying no and, and little Gmail things. Um, I think a, a comment that, uh, a question that someone has posed is how, um, with all of this in mind, how do, or how or when do you create space or time to actually decide what you want and, as you said, who your values are? so that you can then go ahead and implement those strategies. When when have you kind of figured that out or do you set aside time to reflect on that regularly or how, how, when do you find the time to think about that? I actually do it daily. <laughs> I do it daily. I, I think of each day I um, say, what were three things that went really well that I'm happy with? What are three things I would have liked to do differently? And then for the next day, what are three things that I'm looking forward to and looking back, what are three things that, again, I might have wanted to do differently? So mm. that's, to me, really important. And that's all tied up in my values. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and I think uh, another, I think that obviously this is a huge topic um, and a lot of people with a lot of different questions and comments. Um, and I think, Sharon, a lot of people have found quite interesting that it's interesting to dive into the research behind the unfortunate sort of systemic um, stereotypes that we have that differ between men and women with this warmth and competence. Um, I think some comments that are coming through that I think um, we've all probably felt before is the sense of, you know, why do we have to change? Um, you know, what can we, um, you know, obviously a big part of it is that it's a systemic problem. There are these ingrained biases. Um, you talked about, you know, what can we do in the meantime? And here are some strategies that we can do in the meantime. I think what some people are, if I'm understanding correctly, and I hope I'm summarising everyone's views accurately, I think what some people are concerned about is that are we only perpetuating these stereotypes if we make sure that we're warm and nice all the time as well as competent and, and how can we, as one person, as the system slowly changes, what are things that we can do to also not just conform to what those stereotypes are, but also encourage them to change and for other people to reflect on how they contribute to that as well, which I know is an incredibly complex <laughs> and big question, but I think that's yeah. the, the sentiment. It's a really, it's a really important question and we talked about it last time when we were talking about, I think it was resilience. Why do women have to be resilient, you know, why aren't we changing the systems? And I think we absolutely should be changing the systems and the, we should be, um, challenge when we're in the positions of power um, that hopefully you know women will get to more and more 
we should be creating different systems, creating different norms of behaviour and so on, absolutely. Um, I think I'm really, so I don't want people to think that I'm saying we should go around being all nice and friendly and lovely, because that's actually, what I'm saying is we should be asserting ourselves, mm -hmm. right? We should be asserting ourselves about what is important to us, what we want to achieve, and that goes to Lynette's point about values and so on. We should be asserting ourselves. Um, but we've got to think about how we do that. And if we're lucky enough to be in an environment where we can be direct and clear and assertive and there's no problem, well, fantastic, go for it, right? The reality is, and the research bears this out, that there are many women who are not in that fortunate situation where when they are assertive, they do experience a backlash and it really hurts them. It hurts their performance, it hurts their well-being. Um, and in the end, it means that we'll get less women promoted and in these positions of power to change the system. So I think my, so I don't want people to think I'm saying don't go, well, do go around and being nice and warm and fluffy. I'm, I'm actually not saying that. I'm, I'm saying be assertive. Think about how you are assertive. Um, if you are getting that backlash, you might need to try this strategy of combining some warmth and friendliness with it, which the research suggests work. That's really what I'm saying. So that I'm really glad you gave me the opportunity to clarify that, Georgia, because I would hate people to think I'm, I'm saying we should go around and being nice. The problem is many of us are too nice too much of the time, actually. That's one of the problems. Um, and then the problem is we're not seen as competent. So it's really um, not at all what I'm saying. So thanks for the opportunity to clarify. Um, I think we could probably squeeze in one more either comment from you, Georgia, or quick question to Lynette. Yeah, I think um, perhaps a, a comment or a questions and, and ideas that have come up that maybe flow from exactly what you've just said and the clarification that you've just made, Sharon, is um, in addition to these behaviours that we can enact around assertiveness um, and, and kind of accommodating for the unfortunate consequences that might come from that, um, do you have any ideas or perhaps um, either through the work that you do or through the evidence of how we can then involve um, or make organisations more accountable around the systems that they have, um, either in universities or in workplaces more broadly that might be perpetuating these sorts of um, inequalities around assertiveness and, and speaking up? And I'll yeah. Either Sharon or I Lynette. Yeah, I think I'll just jump in quickly and then Lynette, you can finalise the comment. Um, I, look, I think partly it's about monitoring the outcomes because that's where it really matters. So how many women professors are there? How many women are putting forward grant applications? What's the relative success rate? Um, how many women are on committees um, relative to men? I think really understanding what the outcomes, and, and uh, by the way, I'm I'm not suggesting more women should be on committees. Actually, usually the opposite occurs where women get put on there as a token woman. And, and, then, and then, as I've said before, the research would suggest they're not necessarily going to be appreciated for that. But looking at those outcomes that are really important would be a very good start. And then I think you can also backtrack from that if there are issues uh, to look at the, the behaviours, the leadership, um, the workloads, you know, what's the workload for men and women? We know from research that women tend to be more often on short-term contracts, they tend to have higher teaching loads, you know, so should we, we should also be delving not just into the outcomes but the things that influence those outcomes, you know, and then of course we can we can look at things like leadership development and and this sorts of webinar type thing for women as well. It's absolutely about doing all of those things. It's it's and the the point of this series is for people to reflect on what they themselves can do. Um, and my hope is that that means we get many more women in positions of power and influence, so that we can really change some of this stuff. And then we wouldn't have need for women that are like this anymore. <laughs> so Lynette, I don't know if you want to just share yeah. one final comment, and I'm just going to share my screen at the same time that you do. Sure. I, I think the the key thing for me is that when women are in positions of power, they need to be proactive and supporting other women and promoting other women, and, and promoting the issues that affect women. Um, and of course, in my case, I'm also interested in people doing the same thing for Indigenous people. So it's terribly important that we don't pull the, the, the ladder up behind us. That's crucially important. We've got to be there for each other because that's the only change we're going to be able to make. 
Thanks, Lynette. I think that's a beautiful note to conclude on. And I really loved your tip about if you're not sure, should you say yes or no? You know, talking to people um, and talking to other women and getting other people's insights. And I think you're absolutely right. One of the best things we can do is, is support the other women um, around us. And that is part of the purpose of this webinar. So I hope you have all uh, enjoyed it. We're out of time. Sorry we had a few technical difficulties, but um, all of our webinars are recorded. Uh, we've got some other webinars on other topics uh, that you can access there on the website. And I would just like to conclude by acknowledging the wonderful women that are behind this project that go well beyond uh, myself. Um, thank you so much to you, particularly Sana, Isabel and Georgia today. Um, and of course, thank you so much, Lynette, for your wonderful insights. Uh, we really appreciate them. And I hope to see many of uh, you, the people who've come today, thank you to you for coming and giving up your time. Think about your small goal that you might uh, have from today and very much hope to see you for our next uh, webinar, which we'll be advertising soon. So thank you, everybody. And uh, that's uh, it for today. Oops, I might just leave that up. So uh, that's terrific. So um, Lynette, thank you. We will, no I will, I, I will give you a little call a little bit later. If sure. That's all right. Okay. No problem. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Bye. everyone.